Okay, thank you. So first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. So I want to talk about a way in which can, can generate level statistics according to the Gaussian symplectic ensemble without any need for spin. And this is joint work with Chris John, who is now at the Weizmann Institute, and with Martin Sieber. So first, a little bit of motivation. So of course, we expect that uh, chaotic uh, quantum systems have spectral statistics in agreement with predictions by random matrix theory. But then the question is, uh, which ensemble from random matrix theory should we actually use? And of course, the choice of the ensemble should depend on the symmetries of the system. So symmetry would be operator uh, commuting with the Hamiltonian, but we are also interested only in symmetries that leave the transitional amplitudes uh, invariant. So we are only interested in symmetries that, if applied to uh, two wave functions, leave the absolute value squared of the overlap uh, between these two wave functions invariant. Pardon? Yeah, it, yeah, 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 transition probabilities, yeah. Uh, so there are two ways uh, to realize this. And the simplest way is actually to have uh, unitary symmetries. So applied to the two wave functions, uh, they leave the overlap directly invariant. Uh, but there's another possibility to have anti-unitary uh, symmetries or uh, generalized uh, time reversal. Uh, symmetries and uh, these if applied to two uh, wave functions uh, don't leave uh, the overlap invariant but they complex conjugate uh, the overlap and therefore of course uh, this transition uh, probability is left invariant and um, if one looks at the theory it turns out that these things can be defined consistently only if one also demands them to be anti-linear so uh, acting on a linear combination of quantum mechanical states. Uh, they act like linear operator apart from the fact uh, that the two coefficients in the linear combination are uh, complex conjugated. And then another condition is uh, because this should be a generalized time reversal operator, uh, we want that the square of this operator applied to a state gives uh, back an equivalent state. Uh, so that should be the same state uh, multiplied with a constant and then due to normalization it would have to be a uh, constant with absolute value one and one can show that if one combines uh, this condition with the anti-unitarity condition one is led to the famous result that these uh, anti-unitary symmetries of generalized time reversal uh, operators should square either to one or to minus one and uh, the most common example is, of course, that we just have a Hamiltonian uh, that is real. Uh, so with a kinetic energy part and a potential part which are real. And then uh, the Hamiltonian would, square, would, would uh, commute with the uh, conventional time reversal operator, which is just a complex conjugation and which squares to one. So that means, I mean, the most common case is, of course, the one uh, with squaring to minus one. And then these symmetries, and I mean, I went through it in a bit uh, of detail because I wanted to stress that the anti uh, that, that the uh, unitary symmetries exist as well. Uh, so these uh, symmetries then uh, determine the choice of a symmetry class. And this uh, is usually just written down for the case that we just have the uh, anti unitary symmetry, so uh, time reversal and its generalizations. And then in the absence of uh, even anti-unitary symmetries, we uh, should use the GUE. Uh, if we have uh, anti-unitary symmetries, anti-unitary sym symmetries squaring uh, to one, we should use the GOE. And if we have an anti-unitary symmetry squaring to minus one, we should use the uh, GSE. So this is just the classification in the absence of any unitary symmetries. And a little bit later in the talk, I will also discuss uh, the case where the anti-unitary uh, anti symmetries are actually combined uh, with unitary symmetries. But I'm going to leave that uh, for later. 
And of course, I'm mainly interested now in the Gaussian symplectic ensemble. And the conventional wisdom about the Gaussian symplectic ensemble is uh, that for it to be physically relevant, uh, we need a system with spin. So the simplest example of a system described by this would be a system, OK, still the conventional kinetic plus potential energy, Hamiltonian, but then also spin orbit coupling, which is expressed through a term with the angular momentum and uh, Pauli matrices uh, modeling the uh, components, x, y, z components of uh, the spin vector. So this would be uh, the Hamiltonian of uh, such a system. And this is uh, now something that is definitely not invariant with respect to complex conjugation uh, because of this sigma 2 uh, term in the uh, spin orbit coupling, which involves I. So it's obviously not uh, real, not invariant under complex conjugation. Uh, but it still has uh, a symmetry, which is a generalized time reversal symmetry. Um, did I mess this, did I mess that up? Uh, I think I, th I, I, I think. Li complex conjugate. Yeah, minus yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I probably messed that up. Yeah, but uh, I mean, in any case, if if real and complex yeah, things are, if, if 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 real and imaginary things are mixed, it's not going to be. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not going to be invariant uh, under uh, complex conjugation. So what we need uh, is actually a generalized time reversal operator, um, which involves the complex conjugation and then multiplication with I uh, times sigma 2, which can also be written as this uh, real sort of symplectic style matrix. And one can show that uh, uh, indeed the Hamiltonian does commute uh, with this operator. So uh, we have a time reversal symmetry, uh, but it's now a symmetry squaring to minus one uh, because, I mean, the complex conjugation squares to one, uh, but this matrix uh, component of the symmetry actually squares to minus one. So this is something that uh, gives rise to GSE statistics. I mean, assuming that it's uh, a fully chaotic system that uh, or base uh, random matrix statistics. So this is sort of the conventional wisdom, how um, GSE statistics arises uh, physically. And the main message of this talk will be that it can also be realized in a different way. But for a moment, I st still stick to the general uh, GSE case and remind, remind of some further things that I'm going to need. So uh, in the case that time reversal squares to minus one a state and it's time reversed, are independent states and they are actually orthogonal to each other and have the same energy, so calmness degeneracy. And uh, we could write the Hamiltonian in the basis of some states and the time reversed of these states. And then uh, the Hamiltonian turns out to have blocks uh, as I've written them here. And if one looks at the structure of these blocks, turns out that they are quaternion real due to the properties of the time reversal operator here. So it's two by two blocks on, with on the diagonal uh, alpha and alpha star, so alpha complex conjugate, and on the off diagonal beta and minus beta star, or equivalently, and I'm going to use them later, uh, these uh, could be written as real linear combinations of, okay, the unit matrix and the quaternions the quaternion uh, matrices are uh, I's uh, times Pauli matrices. So this is the form into which the Hamiltonian can be brought uh, for the system. And what, that was sort of the general uh, background. But not, now what I'm really interested in in this talk is that I want to show you a system where uh, <coughs> 
GSE statistics can arise uh, without any need for spin. And I'll first just uh, describe the system. The system is going to be a quantum graph. Um, and uh, I mean, after introducing the system, I will give you a little bit of background how we actually uh, got to the system. And this is going to involve, I mean, studying the relation between unitary and anti-unitary symmetries with uh, techniques from representation theory. Uh, but this is then more the, the motivation how we got this, but I can actually present the final result without this background, but I think the background uh, will be quite helpful for generalizing our results to other settings. So now I move on to our example. This is a quantum graph. So what are quantum graphs? So first of all, they are graphs. So they have vertices and the vertices are connected by bonds. And uh, the, ver the bonds also have length. And the length are chosen independently for all the bonds. So there's no requirement of conditions to embed them into two dimensions or so. The length are completely uh, independent. Uh, and then we have to define quantum mechanics on this graph. So first of all, we need quantum mechanics on the bonds. And this is simply given by the Schrodinger equation. So uh, here the Schrodinger, one-dimensional Schrodinger equation without potential on each of these bonds, just the kinetic energy uh, term in the Hamiltonian for one dimension acting on the wave function gives the uh, energy, uh, energy times the wave function for an energy eigenfunction. So this is quantum mechanics on the bonds. Um, but we also need some conditions what happens quantum mechanically at the uh, vertices. Uh, and there are different choices uh, for this. And a common choice is, first of all, continuity of the wave function at the vertices. So if I'm at a vertex and I look for the limit of the wave function on this bond and on this bond as I approach the vertex, it should coincide. And then uh, another condition uh, that one usually demands uh, are Neumann conditions for the first derivatives of the wave function. Uh, so these are defined uh, with the convention that, I mean, we single out some vertex and then we take the coordinates along the adjacent bonds always to increase when we go away uh, from the vertex. And then our condition is, yeah? Is your model in in space? Can you say that again? No, it's not, it's not embedded into Euclidean space. So otherwise, you would have restrictions on the length. And no, we, you, you, you have still one-dimensional one bonds. Bond. So you can have a one-dimensional coordinate along each of the bonds. So the idea is, the can be yeah, yeah, the length can still be arbitrary. The length then can still be arbitrary. So either you give up about any uh, intuition for it at all, but because I'm proposing an experiment in the end, uh, the point is that you could yeah. you, 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 you could have them uh, re realize it in real life if you just have a uh, bond that you are bending and that is not a straight line. Yeah, but uh, so so that but there is no restriction that it should be embedded into R squared with straight lines. Well, yeah, right, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, no, it's not, not, no requirement to embed it anywhere with uh, straight lines. And I mean, if you can curve, uh, if, if, you, if, you, if, if, of course, if you can bend all the curves, uh, <laughs> then you can still realize it in a laboratory nevertheless. So the condition here was, uh, okay, so my, my condition for the coordinates in order to formulate this condition was that they increase uh, from the vertex, uh, from, from a given vertex along all the bonds. And then the requirement is that the sum over the first derivatives along the bonds taken in the limit of going to the vertex is zero. And this is actually quite natural condition because if you imagine this condition for a single for, for a bond that is uh, for, for a vertex that is connected to only two bonds, uh, then okay, it would mean that the derivatives of the wave function on the two sides are equal and opposite. Uh, but that's just due to this weird choice of coordinate directions. If I take the coordinate directions, which are more natural for 
a vertex attached to two bonds, I would have the coordinate just increase uh, steadily along the two bonds that are attached to it. And then this condition of having opposite signs uh, turns into the condition that the derivative uh, is just continuous at the vertices. So therefore, uh, it's sort of the natural generalization of uh, continuous first derivatives, and it's a reasonable so boundary have condition. Have a line like that with one vertex yeah. on it, so it has uh, two lines coming out. Is that, is that vertex irrelevant then, or not? Uh, at, at, at the level of what I'm doing here, it's actually irrelevant. Uh, on the next slide, on the next slide, I will do things uh, with vertices attached to two bonds, but that's going to be different boundary conditions. So what I said is just motivating a bit this definition that is not uh, completely weird to come up with it. But it's a unitary map to the same graph with the point removed yeah. and no boundary condition. It's always irrelevant. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, 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 so a single. A single uh, uh, vertex with two bonds attached with the boundary conditions on this slide <laughs> is going to be irrelevant. Uh, on, a, on, the, on the next slide, I will do okay. something different with it. So I'm still interested sort of in uh, vertices of this type. And uh, now the general observation is that uh, quantum graphs are actually, I mean, their spectral statistics is in line with random matrix theory, which sort of hand wavily the condition is that this applies to large uh, and well-connected graphs. And there's a lot of literature uh, trying to understand that properly and also uh, making this condition much more rigorous. But I'm not going to go into that. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm just sort of uh, sticking with this hand wavy characterization, large and well-connected graphs uh, display RMT statistics. And then the ensemble has to be chosen according to the symmetries of the system. So the simplest case is that the Hamiltonian is here is real. And um, uh, also uh, the boundary condition is symmetric with respect to complex conjugation. And then what I would have, uh, I mean, time reversal symmetry with time reversal being the complex conjugation operator, so squaring to one, and therefore GOE statistics. Now I come to the question whether one could somehow break time reversal uh, invariance. And this is going to bring in uh, vertices with two bonds attached that are not irrelevant. So here I'm showing a graph where time reversal invariance is broken. And uh, by having an additional vertex here with a different vertex condition from the one before, namely that the wave function let's say, uh, above and below uh, this vertex is related by multiplication with minus i. And because uh, this is an imaginary number, now, of course, uh, the graph is no longer symmetric uh, with respect to a complex conjugation. So the uh, symmetry. It's continuity, actually. Yeah, yeah. It's even, it's, even, it's even breaking continuity, yeah. So it's destroying both the previous condition it's both replacing both the previous condition on the wave function and on its first derivative uh, by demanding that both of them are related by multiplication with uh, minus i. So this is a different way of picking boundary conditions. And I'm just, just for this vertex, or every, every time I sort of write a, let, uh, write, write a number next to a vertex, uh, that's going to be different from the uh, standard uh, condition. And now if one applies this, time reversal invariance is broken. So, oops. so this graph would have, what am I doing? So this graph uh, would have uh, GUE statistics, or more precisely, I mean, in the limit of large graphs, and I mean, with the conditions of uh, agreement with random matrix to your Yes, yeah, so we look at, we're interested in the limit of uh, large graphs and the graphs, I mean, the growth of the graphs satisfying certain technical conditions that are a bit. Uh, so it's not to, a single graph you're looking at. Yeah, so it's, it's, the limit, it's the limit of large graphs, and uh, that's 
sort of analogous to the semi-classical limit, technically in many things, but it's really a limit where the system is changed because other, I mean, you can't make the graph larger without changing the graph. Yeah, so that's. Pardon? So, uh, I mean, one have, can have several choices, but you can just uh, take the uh, continuity and Neumann uh, conditions I had on the previous slide on all the vertices where I don't write a number. So you don't multiply them by minus No, no, I don't. I don't. Just, just this one here. Just one point? Pardon? Uh, I mean, in this graph, just one point, but this is not yet our example, so I'm moving. Uh, motivating the idea, and I'll have more of these later. Yeah? So, uh, all these boundary conditions that you know you are classified by Robert Charter and collaborators, there are lots of possibilities. So yeah, yeah, so there, there are also possibilities mixing the uh, wave function itself and its first derivatives, and so on. So, here I'm just uh, taking the easiest thing. <laughs> available, which is this multiplication or Neumann, but there are more possibilities. Not quite, but you are almost describing the picture I have on the next transparency. So it's not, not two eyes, um, but I mean the way to fall back to GOE I'm actually showing here. So this is a graph that geometrically sort of has a, I mean, consists of two subgraphs uh, that uh, geometrically, if I don't look at the uh, phase factors, are identical to each other. So purely geometrically, I would here have here symmetry under parity or rotation by 180 degrees. And then I put in one i and one minus i. So it's almost uh, what you suggested. And this uh, indeed has uh, a new um, time reversal symmetry. So due to the i and minus i, it's no long, again, not a symmetry with respect to complex conjugation. But uh, the combination of complex conjugation and parity or switching to the other copy, which is sort of clear uh, because if you apply the parity or switching between the two copies, uh, it will look the same afterwards, just the i is moved here and the minus i is moved here. But then we complex conjugate and then the i that is here is turned back into a minus i. So uh, this graph is now symmetric with respect to parity times complex conjugation, uh, which squares to one again because parity and complex conjugation both square to one. So this would uh, can be a graph uh, displaying GOE statistics. And now, uh, starting from this graph, we could think of uh, a way to maybe build GSE statistics. Uh, and this uh, can be realized by adding two more vertices. And this vertex here has uh, a factor one on it. So following our discussion before, I mean, I introduced this purely for beauty and it has no <laughs> uh, influence on the dynamics at all. And uh, symmetric to that, uh, there's a vertex with a condition minus one, which means that the wave function to the left and to the right and their derivatives should be related by uh, just flipping uh, the sign. So that is the new graph. And now I'm claiming that this graph also has an anti-unitary symmetry, which involves uh, going to the other copy. So parity, which I'm now writing in terms of the argument of the wave function and complex conjugation and uh, flipping uh, one sign here. Uh, but the sign is only flipped if x is in the right part of the graph and px is on the left part of the graph. And if x is on the left part and px is on the right side, then uh, it is not flipped. And one can understand that this is a symmetry, so complex conjugation and parity for that the argument is just as in the previous example and for the minus sign. We could, for example, imagine uh, the two points to the right and to the left of this vertex, um, even though I introduced the vertex only sort of for beauty. And these points are mapped, so the, the one here to the right is mapped here to the left and the other way around. Um, but uh, during this mapping, due to this definition with the sign, actually one 
of the wave functions had a sign flipped. So here, uh, the signs of the wave functions on the two sides of the vertices are opposite. And this is just what is in line uh, with my vertex condition here. So this is uh, really a symmetry of this graph. And now I can look what it squares to, and it's not a big surprise that it squares now to minus one, because complex case conjugation and parity applied twice cancel, uh, but there's always only one uh, minus sign appearing if I apply the operator twice. So this is something with GSE statistics or something built in this way and in a, then taking the limit of large graphs as GSE statistics. So this is our uh, proposed graph and we really believe that this can be realized experimentally. Uh, for example, with optical fibers. So people really build these graphs with fibers. And then the question is what to do with the uh, vertex conditions. And it is possible to introduce face factors along a graph uh, based on the Faraday effect. Um, the only potential experimental problem, but maybe it's not even one, is uh, how that in this graph uh, the phases appear at one discrete point. Uh, but this is actually also not necessary. So uh, there's a gauge invariance principle that states that the spectrum of a graph with phases uh, distributed, I mean phase factors distributed sort of continuously over the bonds is equal to the spectrum of a graph uh, with discrete phases on the condition that the cumulative phase along or closed loops along the graph uh, is equal. So uh, even if one can realize experimentally only the continuous phases, it can be done. But in, uh, so in these pictures, you never mention the length of these bonds. Yeah. You assume it, the statements are valid for any choice of length? So I'm, I'm saying that one should really go to larger graphs in terms of size, size, sizes of bonds and so on, and also well-connected graphs. Okay. And in the drawings, I have to admit that it's sort of nicer to draw mm -hmm. them uh, with equal length. But really, uh, really coinciding length would also uh, lead to a symmetry that would have to be taken into account in finding the right ensemble. So uh, I'm, what, what I'm saying is also really for the case that there are no additional symmetries inside. And unfortunately, my drawings sometimes suggest uh, that there would be other symmetries. Yes, yes. So, but I mean, one has to work a little bit because I mean, the naive thing is sort of to just check what the Hamiltonian is doing. But of course, one has to be more precise with checking self adjoint as taking into account the boundary conditions. But this can be done, and the boundary conditions I've described are uh, conditions that lead to self adjointness. What exactly is a large version? Pardon? What do you mean by large version? So, with large version, I mean sort of based on the same principle, uh, but maybe with even more lines, but based on. Uh, with, with more lines and more vertices, but based on the same principle. So I'll show in the very end of the talk a graph uh, that we actually used for numerics. And uh, this is, I mean, not, not much larger than this, but has, has the same uh, principles used. Okay, so this is the graph we are proposing. And now I want to talk a bit about the background, how we got there, uh, because I think this could sort of inspire related work. And for that, we have to study the interplay between geometrical symmetries and unitary symmetries and anti-unitary symmetries. And I mean, the simplest example for a system with a geometric symmetry would actually be a system with uh, reflection symmetry. So like chaotic billiard with reflection symmetry, the spectrum of such a chaotic billiard with reflection symmetry falls into two parts, one composed of where the corresponding eigenfunctions are even under reflection and one where they are odd under reflection. And one can show that these two subspectra both taken individually have GOE statistics. And then one could also look at cross correlations between the two subspectra. And it turns out that the subspectra are uncorrelated uh, with respect to each other. So I think this uh, motivates that sort of looking at subspectra is uh, a good thing to do if you have a system with uh, geometric symmetries. 
And now there's a more general setting in which one can uh, implement this based on representation theory, which would of course be huge overkill just for single reflection symmetry, but I later apply it to the quaternion group. So um, uh, this uh, general setting is based on representation theory. So first of all, you have uh, your classical symmetry operators, uh, which form a group. And I mean, the simple example, this is just the identity operator and the reflection operator. And then you look at quantum symmetry operators obtained from that. And morally, the quantum symmetry operator related to a given classical operator, G, uh, would apply G to the argument of the wave function. Uh, but here, the convention is a little bit different because you want left multiplication of classical operations to be equivalent to left multiplication of quantum operations and not switch between left and right multiplication. And due to this technicality, the proper definition that people use is that the quantum operator corresponding to G applies the inverse of G to the argument of the wave function. Then if G is a classical symmetry, this is a quantum symmetry commuting with the Hamiltonian and these quantum symmetries form a representation of the classical symmetry group. So the quantum symmetry relating to a product of classical symmetries is the product of the corresponding quantum symmetries. Um, and now, uh, what does this have to do with the spectrum? So in a perfect world, one would maybe hope that one can diagonalize simultaneously these quantum symmetry operators and the Hamiltonian, but it doesn't quite work like this. At least what we can do is to simultaneously diagonalize the Hamiltonian and block diagonalize uh, the symmetry operators. And uh, here are the blocks, okay, um, they can actually be repeated. I mean, everything else is zero here. And again, for this reason, with left multiplication, right multiplication, the convention is to write the blocks as a transposed uh, of a matrix. Uh, and now what are? The blocks, so the blocks are matrix, uh, involve matrix representations of the classical group. So matrices uh, that have the same group structure as the elements of our group. So the representation of a product of uh, classical symmetries so it should be the product of the matrix representations of these symmetries. And there are, of course, different ways in which one can find representations of a symmetry group in terms of matrices. And I'm only interested in the irreducible representations, so loosely speaking, sort of representations that can be, can't be expressed in terms of smaller matrices. Uh, and then alpha here is labeling the different ways to find irreducible representations for the group. So these are uh, the transpose of these things are going to the diagonal form of the symmetry operator. And then another interesting thing is that all the eigenfunctions compared to the same block in the symmetry operator are actually energy degenerate. So we could, uh, depending on the matrix dimension, find uh, vectors, vector psi, whose uh, elements are energy degenerate uh, energy eigenfunctions and I mean how they um, transform under the uh, matrix uh, and, 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 and under the quantum symmetry is then simply given by looking at this form and uh, the symmetry operator applied to psi gives the multiplication of psi with uh, the transposed of the uh, representation matrices. So the message from this is that it actually makes sense also in general to look at uh, spectra at subspectra uh, and in particular at subspectra that are related to uh, the irreducible uh, representations and then there's even this internal structure inside the subspectra uh, that um, the eigenfunctions grouped into these vectors have uh, the same energy levels. Okay so now we are interested in finding out what is the statistics inside the subspectra and for that we have to uh, take into account that there are different types of representations. So the most 
a general thing are representations that just involve complex matrices and that can't be uh, brought to a sim sim simpler form by similarity transformation. Uh, but there are also uh, um, uh, representations that through a simultaneous similarity transformation applied to all the matrices can be brought to a simpler, a simpler form. So for example, to a, a form where the matrices are real or to a form where the matrices are quaternion real, where I defined quaternion real when I was talking about spin uh, earlier. And these representations are also sometimes called pseudo real uh, representations. So this is a classification into three types, which <coughs> reminds a little of the classification into three types of the uh, behavior under time reversal. Um, but it's not quite the same, but we, 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 we should be interested in how they uh, interact with each other. So we can draw a three by three table, uh, first distinguishing according to time reversal properties of the system, no time reversal invariance, time reversal squaring to one, and time reversal squaring to minus one. And then uh, we look at uh, subspectra in these systems that are associated to complex representations real representations and pseudo real representations. And this gives this uh, three by three table, where for example, we see that if we have a complex representation uh, for a subspectrum, then the statistics is GUE regardless of what is happening with time reversal. If it's a real representation, then it's the situation that we would have without all this uh, Geometrical symmetry stuff, so we have GUE without time reversal, GOE with time reversal squaring to one, GSE uh, with time reversal squaring to minus one. And then there's the line that sort of motivated the work that I presented before. Uh, so if you have a pseudo real representation, then it's like before, but the GSE and the GOE entry are interchanged. So we get GSE statistics, if we have a system that as a whole has a time reversal symmetry squaring to one, uh, but we are restricting ourselves to a subspectrum uh, related to a pseudo real representation of the symmetry group. And then we expect in the subspectrum GSE statistics. And I mean, we were originally led to this by sort of by, by following semi classical approach to. Uh, spectral statistics, so that's how we originally got uh, this table, but I'm not going to talk about the semi-classics today, but I at least want to give sort of a sketch uh, explaining uh, this particular entry in the table. And I cons consider the special case that the time reversal squaring to one is just complex conjugation and that I have a two-dimensional pseudo-real uh, representation should, so the representation just involves two by two matrices. And then I recall from the previous uh, page, uh, okay, the eigenfunctions were grouped into these vectors transforming uh, under the symmetry operation with the transpose of the representation matrices. But now time reversal is an important uh, operation here, so I might also be interested in what happens with T psi under the quantum symmetry operation. And this one can easily check by looking at this formula, so I can take this formula and apply complex conjugation everywhere. And the U's are real. Uh, the psi is just replaced by psi star or T psi. Uh, but unfortunately, this uh, matrix, or fortunately, this, this uh, transposed matrix is also complex conjugated. So the, uh, the T psi transforms under the symmetry with the complex conjugate of the transposed matrix or with the, with the adjoint matrix. So it looks like if the time reverse of the psi is transforming different way than psi itself, then this time reversal operator is not really compatible with the structure that we have in our subspace of wave functions associated to the subspectrum. So it's maybe not really the right time reversal operator to consider when we look at the subspectrum. Uh, but instead, we can look at the operator that 
contains the previous time reversal operator, but multiplication with a matrix 0, 1, minus 1, 0. So uh, very much looking like the matrix that we had uh, in the uh, spin case. And uh, one can show that uh, with this operator, which is called the transfer time reversal operator, first of all, the T bar psi transforms as we like it, namely uh, just with the transpose of the matrix. Um, and also, if we restrict to the subspace of wave functions belong to our, our subspectrum, uh, then this transfer time reversal operator also uh, commutes with the Hamiltonian. So it looks like this transfer time reversal operator is actually the one that one should use to study the statistics on the subspectrum. And the transferred time reversal operator squares to minus one, so we expect GSE statistics. So this is sort of symmetry argument why we get GSE here and I mean about the existence of these transferred operators we learned uh, from a paper by Martin Sunbauer where it was used in a different context um, but here, here it shows sort of an unusual way to get GSE statistics. So now when we had this uh, block in the table and we wanted to get an example for it and we decided to look for a quantum graph uh, so we need some, some more quantum graph that has a symmetry group that even allows for pseudo-real representations. Um, so I'm now, now sort of going to describe what we did there. So the first thing is that we need a symmetry group that allows for pseudo-real representations. And the simplest group allowing for pseudo-real representation is actually the quaternion group. So it contains plus and minus the identity and plus minus i, j, k, which are the things that I drew just before, so i times Pauli matrices, and i, j, k are uh, sort of generalizations of the imaginary unit, so they square to minus one, and i, j, k is also minus one. So this is the group for which we wanted to get the graph, <laughs> and it's almost immediate that this group has a pseudo-real representation, uh, because you could simply uh, represent the group elements with the matrices that I wrote down earlier and they are quaternions so they are obviously uh, quaternion real so this is sort of by definition the simplest group with a quaternion real representation and another property that we used is that it's generated by the elements i and j so we can write all the elements in the group as products of i and j using these relations between the group elements. So that's the group to start from and now we need a graph. And uh, we learned actually from uh, Rami Band that there's a general way in which uh, when you have a group you can get a graph. Uh, this is called a Cayley graph. Uh, so to draw a Cayley graph first of all you draw a vertex for every group element. So here there are eight vertices related to the eight group elements. And then you draw bonds for uh, the generators. So um, more, more precisely, I draw a bond. I mean, I have two types of bonds because there are generators I and J. And I draw a bond related to I always between two vertices. If I can get from one vertex to the other by right multiplication with I. So I've done this here with these blue bonds. And I'm a bit lazy and I just check the trivial case that I, 1 and I are related by multiplying with I. So there's a blue bond between these and for the eight others, uh, please believe me. Uh, so this is the first type of bonds. And now, because we want this to be a quantum graph, we have the additional structure that does not exist in the group theory. Uh, I mean, in the Cayley graphs, they appear in group theory. I want, want to have a length on the bonds. And I define the length of all the bonds related to I as equal to some value Li. And then for the other generator, I do the same. So every time two bonds are related by uh, right multiplication with J, I draw a red bond between them. And I also choose uh, the length of all the red bonds equal. So this is now 
a graph constructed based on the quaternion group and I should show that the quaternion group is really a symmetry group of that graph. So I draw it again and now um, I want to show for example that it's invariant under left multiplication now with the group element i. So it's uh, symmetric with respect to left multiplication with respect to any group element. And to do that I draw it again and I replace every group element uh, by the group element obtained from it by left multiplication with i and I get the graph on the right uh, which I mean obviously has the same lines but the labeling of the uh, vertices is changed uh, but it's really equivalent to the graph here uh, because I could uh, return it to that graph uh, by rotation so if I take this and do it like put it like this then it's uh, identical to the previous graph so it's invariant on a left multiplication with i and one can ch show in the same way that it's invariant with respect to left multiplication with respect to any group element. So this is now a graph symmetric with respect to a symmetry group that has a pseudo real representation and I mean it's not yet the graph that I showed before. So the first thing is I mean I would like this to be uh, GS, uh, have a GSE subspectrum so for this one has to satisfy the conditions for GSE statistics or for any matrix statistics so the graphs should be uh, large and uh, well connected and this graph is still a little bit uh, too simple so we now have to build something based on the same principle uh, but adding complexity and then it will be faithful to our IMT uh, and the way we do that is uh, that we blow up the previous vertices to subgraphs. So here we have a vertex related to the group element K and to add complexity we replace that vertex by a subgraph uh, with several different vertices and bonds inside. So every vertex here gets replaced by a subgraph and the subgraphs all have the same structure and also the uh, bonds uh, get replaced by bonds between the subgraphs and even I mean one bond between vertices can be replaced by several different bonds between uh, vertices in the attached subgraph. So this is basically sort of using the same principle but trying to make the graph a little bit more complicated. And uh, when we do that we have indeed a graph with a GSE subspectrum. Uh, because we have uh, symmetry with respect to a pseudo uh, symmetry group with a pseudo real representation and it's complicated enough to be faithful to IMT. So that's the first step, or I don't know how to remember, but uh, uh, that's the step which uh, leads to uh, a graph with a GSE subspectrum. But we could try to do it even better and sort of isolate just the GSE subspectrum in a graph. So and here you actually take this original nice boundary conditions yeah. each vertex, on each line. Yeah, yeah, so f for the moment I still have the original nice boundary conditions. You take the nice boundary conditions but you put the symmetry in this one. Yeah, 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 yeah. right, right. So, so, v so far it's all nice boundary conditions. In the very end the strange boundary conditions will will come in but at the moment they it's still all nice boundary conditions but then also yeah, only two more minutes, pardon? Two more minutes. Two more minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay so the uh, next thing is we want to isolate the subspectrum and uh, for that we remember the uh, case of reflection uh, symmetric systems where one can isolate the subspectrum uh, in a reflection symmetric system by going to a fundamental domain uh, so one, one half of the system separated by the symmetry line and then uh, one also has to define boundary conditions on uh, this symmetry line. Uh, so in, in, the, in, the, in the reflection symmetric system one, could, can, can set a, one can introduce directly boundary conditions or Neumann boundary conditions on the symmetry line and this selects the even or the odd spectrum and basically we do the same here. Uh, we just have to decide what is the fundamental domain of this graph and because 
whatever happens close to the eight group elements is symmetric with respect to each other. The right fundamental domain is to take an eight of the graph around uh, one of these vertices. Then the boundary uh, is composed of these four points. And then using representation theory and uh, speeding up, um, we uh, need uh, boundary conditions uh, connecting these. And what we get is uh, boundary conditions that can be formulated only if the wave function uh, if, 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 if the eigenfunctions are grouped into uh, these vectors psi, and then they have the form of uh, multiplication with a matrix inside a graph uh, with uh, two-dimensional combinations of two energy eigenfunctions. So this is almost uh, what we had before, and now the thing that I really showed before we get if we get rid of this two component behavior uh, in this graph. And this we can do by taking two copies of the graph and letting one component of the vector psi live on one component and live, let the other component of the vector psi live on the other copy of the graph. And this uh, combined uh, with uh, increasing complexity uh, leads to the picture that I showed just before where the entries minus i, i, minus 1, and the 1, which was a bit fake because it doesn't change anything, uh, were or are originating from the entries of these matrices. And because I'm really late now, so we did numerics for a slightly more complicated graph. Uh, and it's close to the GSE. Uh, I mean, very close to the GSE uh, curve. So the blue one is the numerical result, and the black one is the GSE curve. And this is the graph for which we really do, did the numerics, which is slightly more complicated than the one that I showed in particular. Uh, there are two um, bonds with each of the uh, numbers uh, attached uh, that I had before. So that's uh, what I wanted to say.